This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 4 Sounds. But while we are confined to books, though the most select and classic, and read only particular written languages, which are themselves but dialects and provincial, we are in danger of forgetting the language which all things and events speak without metaphor, which alone is copious and standard. Much is published, but little printed. The rays which stream through the shutter will be no longer remembered when the shutter is wholly removed. No method nor discipline can supersede the necessity of being forever on the alert. What is a course of history or philosophy or poetry, no matter how well selected, or the best society, or the most admirable routine of life compared with the discipline of looking always at what is to be seen. Will you be a reader, a student merely, or a seer? Read your fate, see what is before you, and walk on into futurity. I did not read books the first summer. I hoed beans. Nay, I often did better than this. There were times when I could not afford to sacrifice the bloom of the present moment to any work, whether of the head or hands. I love a broad margin to my life. Sometimes, in a summer morning, having taken my accustomed bath, I sat in my sunny doorway from sunrise till noon, wrapped in a reverie, amidst the pines and hickories and sumacs, in undisturbed solitude and stillness, while the birds sing around or flitted noiseless through the house, until by the sun falling in at my west window, with the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time. I grew in those seasons, like corn in the night, and they were far better than any work of the hands would have been. They were not time subtracted from my life, but so much over and above my usual allowance. I realized what the Orientals mean by contemplation and the forsaking of works. For the most part, I minded not how the hours went. The day advanced as if to light some work of mine. It was morning, and lo, now it is evening, and nothing memorable is accomplished. Instead of singing like the birds, I silently smiled at my incessant good fortune. As the sparrow had its trill sitting on the hickory before my door, so had I my chuckle or suppressed warble which he might hear out of my nest. My days were not days of the week, bearing the stamp of any heathen deity, nor were they minced into hours and fretted by the ticking of a clock, for I lived like the Puri Indians, of whom it is said that for yesterday, today, and tomorrow they have only one word, and they express the variety of meaning by pointing backward for yesterday, forward for tomorrow, and overhead for the passing day. This was 
sheer idleness to my fellow townsmen, no doubt. But if the birds and flowers had tried me by their standard, I should not have been found wanting. A man must find his occasions in himself, it is true. The natural day is very calm, and will hardly reprove his indolence. I had this advantage at least in my mode of life, over those who were obliged to look abroad for amusement to society and the theatre, that my life itself was become my amusement, and never ceased to be novel. It was a drama of many scenes, and without an end. If we were always, indeed, getting our living, and regulating our lives according to the last and best mode we had learned, we should never be troubled with ennui. Follow your genius closely enough, and it will not fail to show you a fresh prospect every hour. Housework was a pleasant pastime. When my floor was dirty, I rose early, and, setting all of my furniture out of doors on the grass, bed and bedstead making but one budget, dashed water on the floor, and sprinkled white sand from the pond on it, and then with a broom scrubbed it clean and white. And by the time the villagers ha had broken their fast, the morning sun had dried my house sufficiently to allow me to move in again, and my meditations were almost uninterrupted. It was pleasant to see my whole household effects out on the grass, making a little pile like a gypsy's pack, and my three-legged table, from which I did not remove the books and pen and ink, standing amid the pines and hickory. They seemed glad to get out themselves, and as if unwilling to be brought in. I was sometimes tempted to stretch an awning over them and take my seat there. It was worth the while to see the sun shine on these things, and hear the free wind blow on them. So much more interesting most familiar objects look out of doors than in the house. A bird sits on the next bough. Life everlasting grows under the table, and blackberry vines run round its legs. Pine cones, chestnut burrs, and strawberry leaves are strewn about. It looks as if this was the way these forms came to be transferred to our furniture, to tables, chairs, and bedsteads, because they once stood in their midst. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond, to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. In my front yard grew the strawberry, blackberry, and life everlasting, John's wart, and goldenrod, shrub, oaks, and sand cherry, blueberry, and ground nut. Near the end of May, the sand cherry, Serasus pumilla, adorned the sides of the path with its delicate flowers arranged in umbels cylindrically about its short stems, which last in the fall weighed down with good-sized and handsome cherries, fell over in wreaths like rays on every side. I tasted them out of compliment to nature, though they were scarcely palatable. The sumac, rus glabra, grew luxuriantly about the house, pushing up through the embankment which I had made, and growing five or six feet the first season. 
its broad pinnate tropical leaf was pleasant though strange to look on the large buds suddenly pushing out late in the spring from dry sticks which had seemed to be dead developed themselves as by magic into graceful green and tender boughs an inch in diameter and sometimes as i sat at my window so heedlessly did they grow and tax their weak joints i heard a fresh and tender bough suddenly fall like a fan to the ground when there was not a breath of air stirring broken off by its own weight in august the large masses of berries which when in flower had attracted many wild bees gradually assumed their bright velvety crimson hue and by their weight again bent down and broke the tender limbs as i sit at my window this summer afternoon hawks are circling about my clearing the tantivy of wild pigeons flying by two and threes athwart my view or perching restless on the white pine boughs behind my house gives a voice to the air a fish hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish a mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes a frog by the shore the sedge is bending under the weight of the reed birds flitting hither and thither and for the last half hour i have heard the rattle of railroad cars now dying away and then reviving like the beat of a partridge conveying travelers from boston to the country for i did not live so out of the world as that boy who as i hear was put out to a farmer in the east part of the town but ere long ran away and came home again quite down at the heel and homesick he had never seen such a dull and out-of-the-way place the folks were all gone off why you couldn't even hear the whistle i doubt if there is such a place in massachusetts now in truth our village has become a butt for one of those fleet railroad shafts and o'er our peaceful plain its soothing sound is concord the fitchburg railroad touches the pond about a hundred rods south of where i dwell i usually go to the village along its causeway and am as it were related to society by this link the men on the freight trains who go over the whole length of the road bow to me as to an old acquaintance they pass me so often and apparently they take me for an employee and so i am i too would fain be a track repairer somewhere in the orbit of the earth the whistle of the locomotive penetrates my woods summer and winter sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard informing me that many restless city merchants are arriving within the circle of the town or adventurous country traders from the other side as they come under one horizon they shout their warning to get off the track to the other heard sometimes through the circles of two towns here come your groceries country your rations countrymen nor is there any man so independent on his farm that he can say them nay and here's your pay for them screams the countryman's whistle timber like long battering rams going twenty miles an hour against the city's walls and chairs enough to seat all the weary and heavy laden that dwell within them with such huge and lumbering civility the country hands a chair to the city all the indian huckleberry hills are stripped all the cranberry meadows are raked into the city up comes the cotton down goes the woven cloth up comes the silk down goes the woolen 
up comes the books but down goes the wit that writes them when i meet the engine with its train of cars moving off with planetary motion or rather like a comet for the beholder knows not if with that velocity and with that direction it will ever revisit this system since its orbit does not look like a returning curve with its steam cloud like a banner streaming behind it in golden and silver wreaths like many a downy cloud which i have seen high in the heavens unfolding its masses to the light as if this traveling demigod this cloud compeller would ere long take the sunset sky for the livery of his train when i hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort like thunder shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils what kind of winged horse or fiery dragon they will put into the new mythology i don't know it seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it if all were as it seems and men made the elements their servants for noble ends if the cloud that hangs over the engine were the perspiration of heroic deeds or as beneficent as that which floats over the farmer's fields then the elements and nature herself would cheerfully accompany men on their errands and be their escort i watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that i do the rising of the sun which is hardly more regular their train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher going to heaven while the cars are going to boston conceals the sun for a minute and casts my distant field into the shade a celestial train beside which the petty train of cars which hugs the earth is but the barb of the spear the stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed fire too was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off if the enterprise were as innocent as it is early if the snow lies deep they strap on him snowshoes and with the giant plow plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard in which the cars like a following drill barrow sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed all day the fire steed flies over the country stopping only that his master may rest and i am awakened by his tramp and defiant snort at midnight when in some remote glen in the woods he fronts the elements encased in ice and snow and he will reach his stall only with the morning star to start once more on his travels without rest or slumber or perchance at evening i hear him in his stable blowing off the superfluous energy of the day that he may calm his nerves and cool his liver and brain for a few hours of iron slumber if the enterprise were as heroic and commanding as it is protracted and unwearied far through unfrequented woods on the confines of towns where once only the hunter penetrated by day in the darkest night dart these bright saloons without the knowledge of their inhabitants this moment stopping at some brilliant station house in town or city where a social crowd is gathered 
the next in the dismal swamp, scaring the owl and fox. The startings and arrivals of the cars are now the epochs in the village day. They go and come with such regularity and precision, and their whistle can be heard so far that the farmers set their clocks by them, and thus one well-conducted institution regulates a whole country. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Did they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? There is something electrifying in the atmosphere of the former place. I have been astonished at the miracles it has wrought, that some of my neighbors who, I should have prophesied once for all, would never get to Boston by so prompt a conveyance, are on hand when the bell rings. To do things railroad fashion is now the byword and it is worth the while to be warned so often and so sincerely by any power to get off its track. There is no stopping to read the riot act, no firing over the heads of the mob in this case. We have constructed, we have constructed a fate, an atropos, that never turns aside. Let that be the name of your engine. Men are advertised that at a certain hour and minute these bolts will be shot toward particular points of the compass, yet it interferes with no man's business, and the children go to school on the other track. We live the steadier for it. We are all educated thus to be sons of tell. The air is full of invisible bolts. Every path but your own is the path of fate. Keep on your own track, then. What recommends commerce to me is its enterprise and bravery. It does not clasp its hands and pray to Jupiter. I see these men every day go about their business with more or less courage and content, doing more even than they suspect, and perchance better employed than they could have consciously devised. I am less affected by their heroism, who stood up for half an hour in the front line at Buena Vista, than by the steady and cheerful valor of the men who inhabit the snow-plough for their winter quarters, who have not merely the three o'clock in the morning courage, which Bonaparte thought was the rarest, but whose courage does not go to rest so early, who go to sleep only when the storm sleeps or the sinews of their iron steed are frozen. On this morning of the great snow, perchance, which is still raging and chilling men's blood, I bear the muffled tone of their engine bell from out the fog bank of their chilled breath, which announces that the cars are coming. Without long delay, notwithstanding the veto of a New England northeast snowstorm, and I behold the plowmen, covered with snow and rime, their heads peering above the mold board which is turning down other than daisies in the nests of field mice, like boulders of the Sierra Nevada that occupy an outside place in the universe. Commerce is unexpectedly confident and serene, alert, adventurous, and unwearied. It is very natural in its methods withal, far more so than many fantastic enterprises and sentimental experiments, and hence its singular success. I am refreshed 
and expanded when the freight train rattles past me, and I smell the stores which go dispensing their odors all the way from Long Wharf to Lake Champlain, reminding me of foreign parts, of coral reefs and Indian oceans and tropical climes and the extent of the globe. I feel more like a citizen of the world at the sight of the palm-leaf which will cover so many flaxen New England heads the next summer, the manila hemp, and coconut husks, the old junk, gunny bags, scrap iron and rusty nails. This carload of torn sails is more legible and interesting now than if they should be wrought into paper and printed books. Who can write so graphically the history of the storms they have weathered as these rents have done? They are proof-sheets which need no correction. Here goes lumber from the main woods, which did not go out to sea in the last freshet, risen four dollars on the thousand because of what did go out or was split up. Pine, spruce, cedar, first, second, third, and fourth qualities, so lately all of one quality, to wave over the bear and moose and caribou. Next rolls Thomaston lime, a prime lot, which will get far among the hills before it gets slacked. These rags and bales of all hues and qualities the lowest condition to which cotton and linen descend, the final result of dress, of patterns which are now no longer cried up, unless it be in Milwaukee, as those splendid articles, English, French, or American prints, ginghams, muslins, etc., gathered from all quarters both of fashion and poverty, going to become paper of one color, or a few shades only, on which forsooth will be written tales of real life, high and low, and founded on fact. This closed car smells of salt fish, the strong New England and commercial scent, reminding me of the grand banks and the fisheries. Who has not seen a salt fish thoroughly cured for this world? so that nothing can spoil it, and putting the perseverance of the saints to blush, with which you may sweep or pave the streets and split your kindlings, and the teamster shelter himself and his lading against sun, wind, and rain behind it, and the trader, as a Concord trader once did, hang it up by his door for a sign when he commences business, until at last his oldest customer cannot tell surely whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral, and yet it shall be as pure as a snowflake, and if it be but put into a pot and boiled will come out an excellent dunfish for a Saturday's dinner. Next, Spanish hides, with the tails still preserving their twist and the angle of elevation they had when the oxen that wore them were careering over the pampas of the Spanish main, a type of all obstinacy, and evincing how almost hopeless and incurable are all constitutional vices. I confess that, practically speaking, when I have learned a man's real disposition, I have no hopes of changing it for the better or worse in this state of existence. As the Orientals say, a cur's tail may be warmed and pressed and bound round with ligatures, and after a twelve years' labor bestowed upon it, still it will retain its natural form. The only effectual cure for such inveteracies as these tales exhibit is to make glue of them, which I believe is what is usually done with them, 
and then they will stay put and stick. Here is a hog's head of molasses, or of brandy, directed to John Smith, Cuttingsville, Vermont, some trader among the green mountains, who imports for the farmers near his clearing, and now perchance stands over his bulkhead and thinks of the last arrivals on the coast, how they may affect the price for him, telling his customers this moment, as he has told them twenty times before this morning, that he expects some by the next train of prime quality. It is advertised in the Cuttingsville Times. While these things go up, other things come down. Warned by the whizzing sound, I look up from my book and see some tall pine hewn on far northern hills, which has winged its way over the green mountains and the Connecticut, shot like an arrow through the township within ten minutes, and scarce another eye beholds it going to be the mast of some great admiral. And hark, here comes the cattle train, bearing the cattle of a thousand hills, sheep cots, stables, and cow yards in the air, drovers with their sticks and shepherd boys in the midst of their flocks, all but the mountain pastures, whirled along like leaves blown from the mountains by the September gale. The air is filled with the bleating of calves and sheep and the hustling of oxen, as if a pastoral valley were going by. When the old bell-weather at the head rattles his bell, the mountains do indeed skip like rams and the little hills like lambs. A carload of drovers, too, in the midst, on a level with their droves now, their vocation gone, but still clinging to their useless sticks as their badge of office. But their dogs, where are they? It is a stampede to them. They are quite thrown out. They have lost the scent. Methinks I hear them barking behind the Peterborough hills, or panting up the western slope of the green mountains. They will not be in at the death. Their vocation, too, is gone. Their fidelity and sagacity are below par now. They will slink back to their kennels in disgrace, or perchance run wild and strike a league with the wolf and the fox. So is your pastoral life whirled past and away. But the bell rings, and I must get off the track and let the cars go by. What's the railroad to me? I never go to see where it ends. It fills a few hollows and makes banks for the swallows. It sets the sand a-blowing and the blackberries a-growing. But I cross it like a cart-path in the woods. I will not have my eyes put out and my ears spoiled by its smoke and steam and hissing. Now that the cars are gone by and all the restless world with them, and the fishes in the pond no longer feel their rumbling, I am more alone than ever. For the rest of the long afternoon, perhaps, my meditations are interrupted only by the faint rattle of a carriage or team along the distant highway. Sometimes, on Sundays, I heard the bells, the Lincoln, Acton, Bedford, or Concord bell, when the wind was favorable. A faint, sweet, and, as it were, natural melody, worth importing into the wilderness. At a sufficient distance over the woods this sound acquires a certain vibratory hum, as if the pine needles in the horizon were the strings of a harp which it swept. All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, 
a vibration of the universal lyre, just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. There came to me in this case a melody which the air had strained, and which had conversed with every leaf and needle of the wood, that portion of the sound which the elements had taken up and modulated and echoed from vale to vale. The echo is, to some extent, an original sound, and therein is the magic and charm of it. It is not merely a repetition of what was worth repeating in the bell, but partly the voice of the wood, the same trivial words and notes sung by a wood-nymph. At evening the distant lowing of some cow in the horizon beyond the woods sounded sweet and melodious, and at first I would mistake it for the voices of certain minstrels, by whom I was sometimes serenaded, who might be straying over hill and dale but soon I was not unpleasantly disappointed when it was prolonged into the cheap and natural music of the cow. I do not mean to be satirical, but to express my appreciation of those youths singing when I state that I perceived clearly that it was akin to the music of the cow, and they were at length one articulation of nature. Regularly at half-past seven in one part of the summer, after the evening train had gone by, the whippoorwills chanted their vespers for half an hour, sitting on a stump by my door, or upon the ridge-pole of the house. They would begin to sing almost with as much precision as a clock. Within five minutes of a particular time, referred to the setting of the sun, every evening. I had a rare opportunity to become acquainted with their habits. Sometimes I heard four or five at once in different parts of the wood, by accident one a bar behind another, and so near me that I distinguished not only the cluck after each note, but often that singular buzzing sound like a fly in a spider's web, only proportionally louder. Sometimes one would circle round and round me in the woods, a few feet distance, as if tethered by a string, when probably I was near its eggs. They sang at intervals throughout the night, and were again as musical as ever, just before and about the dawn. When other birds are still, the screech-owls take up the strain, like mourning women, with their ancient ululu. Their dismal scream is truly Ben Johnsonian, wise midnight hags. It is no honest and blunt to wit to woo of the poets, but, without jesting, a most solemn graveyard ditty the mutual consolations of suicide lovers, remembering the pangs and the delights of supernal love in the infernal groves. Yet I love to hear their wailing, their doleful responses trilled along the woodside, reminding me sometimes of music and singing birds, as if it were the dark and tearful side of music, the regrets and sighs that would fain be sung. They are the spirits, the low spirits and melancholy forebodings of fallen souls that once in human shape night walked the earth and did the deeds of darkness, now expiating their sins with their wailing hymns or threnodies in the scenery of their transgressions. They give me 
a new sense of the variety and capacity of that nature which is our common dwelling. Oh, oh, that I never had been born, sighs one on this side of the pond, and circles with the restlessness of despair to some new perch on the gray oaks, then that I had never been born, echoes another on the farther side with tremulous sincerity, and born comes faintly from far in the Lincoln woods. I was also serenaded by a hooting owl. Near at hand you could fancy it the most melancholy sound in nature, as if she meant by this to stereotype and make permanent in her choir the dying moans of a human being, some poor, weak relic of mortality who has left hope behind and howls like an animal, yet with human sobs on entering the dark valley, made more awful by a certain gurgling melodiousness. I find myself beginning with the letters G. L. when I try to imitate it, expressive of a mind which has reached the gelatinous, mildewy stage in the mortification of all healthy and courageous thought. It reminded me of ghouls and idiots and insane howlings. But now one answers from far woods in a strain made really melodious by distance. Hoo, 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 hoo. And indeed, for the most part of it, suggested only by pleasing associations, whether heard by day or night, summer or winter. I rejoice that there are owls. Let them do the idiotic and maniacal hooting for men. It is a sound admirably suited to swamps and twilight woods which no day illustrates, suggesting a vast and undeveloped nature which men have not recognized. They represent the stark twilight and unsatisfied thoughts which all have. All day the sun has shone on the surface of some savage swamp where the single spruce stands hung with usnea lichens, and small hawks circulate above, and the chickadee lisps amid the evergreens, and the partridge and rabbit skulk beneath. But now a more dismal and fitting day dawns, and a different race of creatures awakes to express the meaning of nature there. Late in the evening I heard the distant rumbling of wagons over bridges, a sound heard farther than almost any other at night, the baying of dogs, and sometimes again the lowing of some disconsolate cow in a distant barnyard. In the meanwhile all the shore rang with the trump of bullfrogs, the sturdy spirits of ancient wine-bibers and wassailers, still unrepentant, trying to sing a catch in their Stygian lake. If the Walden nymphs will pardon the comparison, for though there are almost no weeds, there are frogs there, who would fain keep up the hilarious rules of their old festal tables, though their voices have waxed hoarse and solemnly grave, mocking at mirth, and the wine has lost its flavor, and become only liquor to distend their paunches, and sweet intoxication never comes to drown the memory of the past, but mere saturation and water-loggedness and distension. The almost aldermanic with his chin upon a heart-leaf which serves for a napkin to his drooling chaps, 
under this northern shore quaffs a deep draught of the once scorned water and passes round the cup with ejaculation trunk 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 and straightway comes over the water from some distant cove the same password repeated where the next in seniority and girth has gulped down to his mark and when this observance has made the circuit of the shores there ejaculates the master of ceremonies with satisfaction drunk and each in his turn repeats the same down to the least distended leakiest and flabbiest paunched that there be no mistake and then the howl goes round again and again until the sun disperses the morning mist and only the patriarch is not under the pond but vainly bellowing tronk from time to time and pausing for a reply i am not sure that i ever heard the sound of cock crowing from my clearing and i thought that it might be worth a while to keep a cockerel for his music merely as a singing bird the note of this once wild Indian pheasant is certainly the most remarkable of any birds, and if they could be naturalized without being domesticated, it would soon become the most famous sound in our woods, surpassing the clangor of the goose and the hooting of the owl, and then imagine the cackling of the hens to fill the pauses when their lord's clarions rested. No wonder that man added this bird to his tame stock, to say nothing of the eggs and drumsticks. To walk in a winter morning in a wood where these birds abounded, their native woods, and hear the wild cockerels crow on the trees, clear and shrill for miles over the resounding earth, drowning the feebler notes of other birds. Think of it. It would put nations on the alert who would not be early to rise and rise earlier and earlier every successive day of his life till he became unspeakably healthy wealthy and wise this foreign bird's note is celebrated by the poets of all countries along with the notes of their native songsters all climates agree with brave chanticleer he is more indigenous even than the natives his health is ever good, his lungs are sound, his spirits never flag. Even the sailor on the Atlantic and Pacific is awakened by his voice. But its shrill sound never roused me from my slumbers. I kept neither dog, cat, cow, pig, nor hens, so that you would have said there was a deficiency of domestic sounds neither the churn nor the spinning wheel nor even the singing of the kettle nor the hissing of the urn nor children crying to comfort one an old-fashioned man would have lost his senses and died of ennui before this not even rats in the wall for they were starved out or rather were never baited in only squirrels on the roof and under the floor a whippoorwill on the ridge-pole, a blue jay screaming beneath the window, a hare or woodchuck under the house, a screech-owl or a cat-owl behind it, a flock of wild geese or a laughing loon on the pond, and a fox to bark in the night. Not even a lark or an oriole, those mild plantation birds, ever visited my clearing no cockerels to crow nor hens to cackle in the yard no yard but unfenced nature reaching up to your very sills a young forest growing up under your meadows and wild sumacs and blackberry vines breaking through into your cellar sturdy pitch pines rubbing and creaking against the shingles for want of room their roots reaching quite 
under the house. Instead of a scuttle or a blind blown off in the gale, a pine tree snapped off or torn up by the roots behind your house for fuel. Instead of no path to the front yard gate in the great snow, no gate, no front yard, and no path to the civilized world. End of chapter 4This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden. Chapter 5. Solitude. This is a delicious evening, when the whole body is one sense, and imbibes delight through every pore. I go and come with a strange liberty in nature, a part of herself. As I walk along the stony shore of the pond in my shirt sleeves, though it is cool as well as cloudy and windy, and I see nothing special to attract me, all the elements are unusually congenial to me. The bullfrogs trump to usher in the night and the note of the whippoorwill is borne on the rippling wind from over the water. Sympathy with the fluttering alder and poplar leaves almost takes away my breath. Yet, like the lake, my serenity is rippled, but not ruffled. These small waves raised by the evening wind are as remote from storm as the smooth reflecting surface. Though it is now dark, the wind still blows and roars in the wood, the waves still dash, and some creatures lull the rest with their notes. The repose is never complete. The wildest animals do not repose, but seek their prey now, the fox and skunk and rabbit, now roam the fields and woods without fear. They are nature's watchmen, links which connect the days of animated life. When I return to my house I find that visitors have been there and left their cards, either a bunch of flowers or a wreath of evergreen, or a name in pencil on a yellow walnut leaf or a chip. They who come rarely to the woods take some little piece of the forest into their hands to play with by the way, which they leave, either intentionally or accidentally. One has peeled a willow wand, woven it into a ring, and dropped it on my table. I could always tell if visitors had called in my absence, either by the bended twigs or grass, or the print of their shoes, and generally of what sex or age or quality they were, by some slight trace left, as a flower dropped or a bunch of grass plucked and then thrown away, even as far off as the railroad, half a mile distant, or by the lingering odor of a cigar or pipe. Nay, I was frequently notified of the passage of a traveler along the highway sixty rods off by the scent of his pipe. There is commonly sufficient space about us. Our horizon is never quite at our elbows, the thick wood is not just at our door, nor the pond, but somewhat is always clearing, familiar and worn by us, appropriated and fenced in some way, and reclaimed from nature. For what reason have I this vast range and circuit some 
square miles of unfrequented forest for my privacy, abandoned to me by men. My nearest neighbor is a mile distant, and no house is visible from any place but the hilltops within half a mile of my own. I have my horizon bounded by woods all to myself, a distant view of the railroad where it touches the pond on the one hand, and of the fence which skirts the woodland road on the other. But for the most part it is as solitary where I live as on the prairies. It is as much Asia or Africa as New England. I have, as it were, my own sun and moon and stars, and a little world all to myself. At night there was never a traveller past my house or knocked at my door, more than if I were the first or last man, unless it were in the spring, when at long intervals some came from the village to fish for pouts. They plainly fished much more in the Walden pond of their own natures, and baited their hooks with darkness. But they soon retreated, usually with light baskets, and left the world to darkness and to me. And the black kernel of the night was never profaned by any human neighborhood. I believe that men are generally still a little afraid of the dark, though the witches are all hung and Christianity and candles have been introduced. Yet I experienced sometimes that the most sweet and tender, the most innocent and encouraging society may be found in any natural object, even for the poor misanthrope and most melancholy man. There can be no very black melancholy to him who lives in the midst of nature and has his senses still. There was never yet such a storm, but it was aeolian music to a healthy and innocent ear. Nothing can rightly compel a simple and brave man to a vulgar sadness. While I enjoy the friendship of the seasons, I trust that nothing can make life a burden to me. The gentle rain which waters my beans and keeps me in the house today is not drear and melancholy, but good for me too. Though it prevents me hoeing them, it is of far more worth than my hoeing. If it should continue so long as to cause the seeds to rot in the ground and destroy the potatoes in the low lands, it would still be good for the grass on the uplands, and being good for the grass, it would be good for me. Sometimes, when I compare myself with other men, it seems as if I were more favored by the gods than they beyond any deserts that I am conscious of, as if I had a warrant and surety at their hands, which my fellows have not, and were especially guided and guarded. I do not flatter myself, but if it be possible, they flatter me. I have never felt lonesome, or in the least oppressed by a sense of solitude, but once, and that was a few weeks after I came to the woods when, for an hour, I doubted if the near neighborhood of man was not essential to a serene and healthy life. To be alone was something unpleasant, but I was at the same time conscious of a slight insanity in my mood, and seemed to foresee my recovery. In the midst of a gentle rain while these thoughts prevailed, 
I was suddenly sensible of such sweet and beneficent society in nature, in the very pattering of the drops, and in every sound and sight around my house, an infinite and unaccountable friendliness, all at once like an atmosphere sustaining me, as made the fancied advantages of human neighborhood insufficient. And I have never thought of them since. Every little pine needle expanded and swelled with sympathy and befriended me. I was so distinctly made aware of the presence of something kindred to me, even in scenes which we are accustomed to call wild and dreary, and also that the nearest of blood to me, and humanist, was not a person nor a villager, that I thought no place could ever be strange to me again. Morning untimely consumes the sad. Few are their days in the land of the living, beautiful daughter of Toscar. Some of my pleasantest hours were during the long rainstorms in the spring or fall, which confined me to the house for the afternoon as well as the forenoon, soothed by their ceaseless roar and pelting, when an early twilight ushered in a long evening in which many thoughts had time to take root and unfold themselves. In those driving northeast rains, which tried the village houses so, when the maid stood ready with mop and pail in front entries to keep the deluge out, I sat behind my door in my little house, which was all entry, and thoroughly enjoyed its protection. In one heavy thunder shower, the lightning struck a large pitch pine across the pond, making a very conspicuous and perfectly regular spiral groove from top to bottom an inch or more deep, and four or five inches wide, as you would groove a walking stick. I passed it again the other day and was struck with awe on looking up and beholding that mark now more distinct than ever, where a terrific and resistless bolt came down out of the harmless sky eight years ago. Men frequently say to me, I should think you would feel lonesome down there and want to be nearer to folks, rainy and sunny days and nights especially. I am tempted to reply to such, this whole earth which we inhabit is but a point in space. How far apart, think you, dwell the two most distant inhabitants of yonder star, the breadth of whose disk cannot be appreciated by our instruments. Why should I feel lonely? Is not our planet in the Milky Way? This which you put seems to me not to be the most important question. What sort of space is that which separates a man from his fellows, and makes him solitary. I have found that no exertion of the legs can bring two minds much nearer to one another. What do we want most to dwell near to? Not to many men, surely, the depot, the post office, the bar room, the meeting house, the school house, the grocery, Beacon Hill, or the Five Points where men most congregate, but to the perennial source of our life, whence in all our experience we have found that to issue, as the willow stands near the water and sends out its roots in that direction, 
this will vary with different natures, but this is the place where a wise man will dig his cellar. I one evening overtook one of my townsmen who has accumulated what is called a handsome property, though I never got a fair view of it, on the Walden Road, driving a pair of cattle to market, who inquired of me how I could bring my mind to give up so many of the comforts of life. I answered that I was very sure I liked it passably well. I was not joking, and so I went home to my bed, and left him to pick his way through the darkness and the mud to Brighton, or Bright Town, which place he would reach some time in the morning. Any prospect of awakening, or coming to life to a dead man, makes indifferent all times and places. The place where that may occur is always the same, and indescribably pleasant to all our senses. For the most part we allow only outlying and transient circumstances to make our occasions. They are, in fact, the cause of our distraction. Nearest to all things is that power which fashions their being. Next to us the grandest laws are continually being executed. Next to us is not the workman whom we have hired, with whom we love so well to talk, but the workman whose work we are. How vast and profound is the influence of the subtle powers of heaven and of earth. We seek to perceive them, and we do not see them. We seek to hear them, and we do not hear them. Identified with the substance of things, they cannot be separated from them. They cause that in all the universe men purify and sanctify their hearts, and clothe themselves in their holiday garments to offer sacrifices and oblations to their ancestors. It is an ocean of subtle intelligences. They are everywhere, above us, on our left, on our right. They environ us on all sides. We are the subjects of an experiment, which is not a little interesting to me. Can we not do without the society of our gossips a little while under these circumstances? Have our own thoughts to cheer us? Confucius says truly, Virtue does not remain as an abandoned orphan. It must of necessity have neighbors. With thinking, we may be beside ourselves in a sane sense. By a conscious effort of the mind, we can stand aloof from actions and their consequences, and all things, good and bad, go by us like a torrent. We are not wholly involved in nature. I may be either the driftwood in the stream, or Indra in the sky looking down on it. I may be affected by a theatrical exhibition. On the other hand, I may not be affected by an actual event which appears to concern me much more. I only know myself as a human entity, the scene, so to speak, of thoughts and affections, and am sensible of a certain 
doubleness by which I can stand as remote from myself as from another. However intense my experience, I am conscious of the presence and criticism of a part of me, which, as it were, is not a part of me, but spectator, sharing no experience, but taking note of it. And that is no more I than it is you. When the play, it may be the tragedy, of life is over, the spectator goes his way. It was a kind of fiction, a work of the imagination only, so far as he was concerned. This doubleness may easily make us poor neighbors and friends sometimes. I find it wholesome to be alone the greater part of the time. To be in company even with the best is soon wearisome and dissipating. I love to be alone. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. We are for the most part more lonely when we go abroad among men than when we stay in our own chambers. A man thinking or working is always alone. Let him be where he will. Solitude is not measured by the miles of space that intervene between a man and his fellows. The really diligent student in one of the crowded hives of Cambridge College is as solitary as a dervish in the desert. The farmer can work alone in the field or the woods all day, hoeing or chopping, and not feel lonesome because he is employed. But when he comes home at night he cannot sit down in a room alone at the mercy of his thoughts, but must be where he can see the folks, and recreate, and, as he thinks, remunerate himself for his day's solitude. And hence he wonders how the student can sit alone in the house all night, and most of the day, without ennui and the blues. But he does not realize that the student, though in the house, is still at work in his field and chopping in his woods as the farmer in his, and in turn seeks the same recreation and society that the latter does though it may be a more condensed form of it. Society is commonly too cheap. We meet at very short intervals, not having had time to acquire any new value for each other. We meet at meals three times a day, and give each other a new taste of that old musty cheese that we are. We have had to agree on a certain set of rules, called etiquette, and politeness, to make this frequent meeting tolerable, and that we need not come to open war, we meet at the post-office, and at the sociable, and about the fireside every night. We live thick, and are in each other's way, and stumble over one another, and I think that we thus lose some respect for one another. Certainly less frequency would suffice for all important and hearty communications. Consider the girls in a factory, never alone, hardly in their dreams. It would be better if they were but one inhabitant to a square mile as where I live. The value of a man is not in his skin that we should touch him. 
I have heard of a man lost in the woods and dying of famine and exhaustion at the foot of a tree, whose loneliness was relieved by the grotesque visions with which, owing to bodily weakness, his diseased imagination surrounded him, and which he believed to be real. So also, owing to bodily and mental health and strength, we may be continually cheered by a like but more normal and natural society, and come to know that we are never alone. I have a great deal of company in my house, especially in the morning, when nobody calls. Let me suggest a few comparisons, that someone may convey an idea of my situation. I am no more lonely than the loon in the pond that laughs so loud, or than Walden Pond itself. What company has that lonely lake, I pray? And yet it has not the blue devils, but the blue angels in it, in the azure tint of its waters. The sun is alone except in thick weather when there sometimes appear to be two, but one is a mock sun. God is alone, but the devil, he is far from being alone. He sees a great deal of company. He is legion. I am no more lonely than a single mullen, or dandelion in a pasture, or a bean-leaf or a sorrel, or a horsefly, or a bumblebee. I am no more lonely than the mill brook, or a weathercock, or the north star, or the south wind, or an April shower, or a January thaw, or the first spider in a new house. I have occasional visits in the long winter evenings, when the snow falls fast and the wind howls in the wood, from an old settler and original proprietor who is reported to have dug Walden Pond, and stoned it, and fringed it with pine woods, who tells me stories of old time and new eternity, and between us we manage to pass a cheerful evening with social mirth and pleasant views of things even without apples or cider. A most wise and humorous friend, whom I love much, who keeps himself more secret than ever did Goff or Whaley, and though he is thought to be dead, none can show where he is buried. An elderly dame, too, dwells in my neighborhood, invisible to most persons, in whose odorous herb garden I love to stroll sometimes, gathering simples and listening to her fables, for she has a genius of unequalled fertility, and her memory runs back farther than mythology, and she can tell me the original of every fable, and on what fact every one is founded, for the incidents occurred when she was young, a ruddy and lusty old dame, who delights in all weathers and seasons, and is likely to outlive all her children yet. The indescribable innocence and beneficence of nature, of sun and wind and rain, of summer and winter, such health, such cheer they afford for ever, and such sympathy have they ever with our race that all nature would be affected, and the sun's brightness fade, and the winds would sigh humanely, and the clouds rain tears, and the woods shed their leaves, and put on mourning in midsummer, if any man should ever for a just cause grieve. Shall I not have intelligence with the earth? Am I not partly leaves and vegetable mold myself? What is the pill which keeps us well, serene, contented? 
not my or thy great-grandfather's, but our great-grandmother nature's universal, vegetable, botanic medicines, by which she has kept herself young always, outlived so many old pars in her day, and fed her health with their decaying fatness. For my panacea, instead of one of those quack vials of a mixture dipped from Acheron and the Dead Sea, which come out of those long, shallow, black schooner-looking wagons which we sometimes see made to carry bottles, let me have a draught of undiluted morning air. Morning air! If men will not drink of this at the fountainhead of the day, why then, we must even bottle up some and sell it in the shops for the benefit of those who have lost their subscription ticket to morning time in this world. But remember, it will not keep quite till noonday, even in the coolest cellar, but drive out the stopples long ere that, and follow westward the steps of Aurora. I am no worshipper of Hygieia, who was the daughter of that old herb-doctor Esculapius, and who is represented on monuments holding a serpent in one hand, and in the other a cup, out of which the serpent sometimes drinks, but rather of Heb, cup-bearer to Jupiter, who was the daughter of Juno and wild lettuce, and who had the power of restoring gods and men to the vigor of youth. She was probably the only thoroughly sound-conditioned, healthy, and robust young lady that ever walked to the globe, and wherever she came it was spring. End of chapter 5This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 6 Visitors. I think that I love society as much as most and am ready enough to fasten myself like a bloodsucker for the time to any full-blooded man that comes in my way. I am naturally no hermit, but might possibly sit out the sturdiest frequenter of the bar-room, if my business called me thither. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, three for society. When visitors came in larger and unexpected numbers, there was but the third chair for them all, but they generally economized the room by standing up. It is surprising how many great men and women a small house will contain. I have had twenty-five or thirty souls, with their bodies at once under my roof, and yet we often parted without being aware that we had come very near to one another. Many of our houses, both public and private, with their almost innumerable apartments, their huge halls and their cellars for the storage of wines and other munitions of peace, appear to be extravagantly large for their inhabitants. They are so vast and magnificent that the latter seem to be only vermin which infest them. I am surprised when the herald blows his summons before some Tremont or Astor or Middlesex house, to see come creeping out over the piazza, for all inhabitants a ridiculous mouse, which soon again slinks into some hole in the pavement. One inconvenience I sometimes experienced in so small a house, the difficulty of getting to a sufficient distance from my guest when we began to utter the big thoughts in big words. 
You want room for your thoughts to get into sailing trim and run a course or two before they make their port. The bullet of your thought must have overcome its lateral and ricochet motion and fallen into its last and steady course before it reaches the ear of the hearer, else it may plough out again through the side of his head. Also our sentences wanted room to unfold and form their columns in the interval. Individuals, like nations, must have suitable broad and natural boundaries, even a considerable neutral ground between them. I have found it a singular luxury to talk across the pond to a companion on the opposite side. In my house we were so near that we could not begin to hear, we could not speak low enough uh, to be heard as when you throw two stones into calm water so near that they break each other's undulations. If we are merely loquacious and loud talkers, then we can afford to stand very near together, cheek by jowl, and feel each other's breath. But if we speak reservedly and thoughtfully, we must be farther apart, that all animal heat and moisture may have a chance to evaporate. If we would enjoy the most intimate society with that in each of us which is without, or above, being spoken to, we must not only be silent, but commonly so far apart bodily that we cannot possibly hear each other's voice in any case. Referred to this standard, speech is for the convenience of those who are hard of hearing, but there are many fine things which we cannot say if we have to shout. As the conversation began to assume a loftier and grander tone, we gradually shoved our chairs farther apart, till they touched the wall in opposite corners, and then commonly there was not room enough. My best room, however, my withdrawing room, always ready for company, on whose carpet the sun rarely fell, was the pine wood behind my house. Thither in summer days, when distinguished guests came, I took them, and a priceless domestic swept the floor and dusted the furniture and kept the things in order. If one guest came, he sometimes partook of my frugal meal, and it was no interruption to conversation to be stirring a hasty pudding or watching the rising and maturing of a loaf of bread in the ashes in the meanwhile. But if twenty came and sat in my house, there was nothing said about dinner." though there might be bread enough for two, more than if eating were a forsaken habit. But we naturally practiced abstinence, and this was never felt to be an offense against hospitality, but the most proper and considerate course. The waste and decay of physical life which so often needs repair seemed miraculously retarded in such a case, and the vital vigor stood its ground. I could entertain thus a thousand as well as twenty, and if any ever went away disappointed or hungry from my house when they found me at home, they may depend upon it that I sympathized with them at least. So easy is it, though many housekeepers doubt it, to establish new and better customs in the place of the old. You need not rest your reputation on the dinners you give." For my own part, I was never so effectually deterred from frequenting a man's house by any kind of Cerberus whatever as by the parade one made about dining me, which I took to be a very polite and roundabout hint never to trouble him so again. I think I shall never revisit those scenes. I should be proud to have, for the motto of my cabin, those lines of Spencer which one of my visitors inscribed on a yellow walnut leaf for a card. Arrived there, the little house they fill. Ne look for entertainment where none was. Rest is their feast, and all things at their will. The noblest mind the best contentment has. When Winslow, afterward governor of the Plymouth Colony, went with a companion on a visit of ceremony to Massasoit on foot through the woods, and arrived tired and hungry at his lodge, they were well received by the king, but nothing was said about eating that day. When the knight arrived, to quote their own words, 
he laid us on the bed with himself and his wife, they at the one end and we at the other, it being only planks, laid a foot from the ground and a thin mat upon them. Two more of his chief men, for want of room, pressed by and upon us, so that we were worse weary of our lodging than of our journey. At one o'clock the next day Massasoit brought two fishes that he had shot, about thrice as big as a bream. These being boiled, there were at least forty looked for a share in them, the most eat of them. This meal only we had in two nights and a day, and had not one of us brought a partridge, we had taken our journey fasting. Fearing that they would be light-headed for want of food and also sleep, owing to the savages' barbarous singing, for they used to sing themselves to sleep, and that they might get home while they had strength to travel, they departed. As for lodging, it is true they were but poorly entertained, though what they found an inconvenience was no doubt intended for an honor. But as far as eating was concerned, I do not see how the Indians could have done better. They had nothing to eat themselves, and they were wiser than to think that apologies could supply the place of food to their guests. So they drew their belts tighter and said nothing about it. Another time, when Winslow visited them, it being a season of plenty with them, there was no deficiency in this respect. As for men, they will hardly fail one anywhere. I had more visitors while I lived in the woods than at any other period in my life. I mean that I had some. I met several there under more favorable circumstances than I could anywhere else. But fewer came to see me on trivial business. In this respect, my company was winnowed by my mere distance from town. I had withdrawn so far within the great ocean of solitude, into which the rivers of society empty, that for the most part, so far as my needs were concerned, only the finest sediment was deposited around me. Beside, there were wafted to me evidences of unexplored and uncultivated continents on the other side. Who should come to my lodge this morning but a true Homeric or Paphlagonian man? He had so suitable and poetic a name that I am sorry I cannot print it here. A Canadian, a woodchopper and postmaker, who can hold fifty posts in a day, who made his last supper on a woodchuck which his dog caught. He too has heard of Homer, and, if it were not for books, would not know what to do rainy days, though perhaps he has not read one wholly through for many rainy seasons. Some priest who could pronounce the Greek itself taught him to read his verse in the testament in his native parish far away, and now I must translate to him while he holds the book Achilles' reproof to Patroclus for his sad countenance. Why are you in tears, Patroclus? like a young girl, or have you alone heard some news from Pythia? They say that Minutius lives yet son of Actor, and Peleus lives son of Achus, among the Myrmidons, either of whom, having died, we should greatly grieve. He says, that's good. He has a great bundle of white oak bark under his arm for a sick man gathered this Sunday morning. I suppose there's no harm in going after such a thing today, says he. To him Homer was a great writer, though what his writing was about he did not know. A more simple and natural man it would be hard to find. Vice and disease, which cast such a somber moral hue over the world, seem to have hardly any existence for him. He was about twenty-eight years old, and had left Canada and his father's house a dozen years before to work in the States, and earn money to buy a farm with that last, perhaps in his native country. He was cast in the coarsest mould, a stout but sluggish body, yet gracefully carried, 
with a thick sunburnt neck, dark bushy hair, and dull, sleepy blue eyes, which were occasionally lit up with expression. He wore a flat gray cloth cap, a dingy wool-colored greatcoat, and cowhide boots. He was a great consumer of meat, usually carrying his dinner to his work a couple of miles past my house, for he chopped all summer, in a tin pail, cold meats, often cold woodchucks, and coffee in a stone bottle which dangled by a string from his belt, and sometimes he offered me a drink. He came along early, crossing my bean-field, though without anxiety or haste to get to his work, such as Yankees exhibit. He wasn't a-going to hurt himself. He didn't care if he only earned his board. Frequently he would leave his dinner in the bushes, when his dog had caught a woodchuck by the way, and go back a mile and a half to dress it and leave it in the cellar of the house where he boarded, after deliberating first for half an hour whether he could not sink it in the pond safely till nightfall. Loving to dwell long upon these themes, he would say as he went by in the morning, How thick the pigeons are! If working every day were not my trade, I could get all the meat I should want by hunting pigeons, woodchucks, rabbits, partridges. By gosh, I could get all I should want for a week and one day. He was a skillful chopper, and indulged in some flourishes and ornaments in his art. He cut his trees level and close to the ground, that the sprouts which came up afterward might be more vigorous, and a sled might slide over the stumps and instead of leaving a whole tree to support his corded wood, he would pare it away to a slender stake or splinter, which you could break off with your hand at last. He interested me because he was so quiet and solitary and so happy withal, a well of good humor and contentment, which overflowed at his eyes. His mirth was without alloy. Sometimes I saw him at his work in the woods, felling trees, and he would greet me with a laugh of inexpressible satisfaction, and a salutation in Canadian French, though he spoke English as well. When I approached him he would suspend his work, and with half-suppressed mirth lie along the trunk of a pine which he had felled, and peeling off the inner bark, roll it up into a ball, and chew it while he laughed and talked. Such an exuberance of animal spirits had he, that he sometimes tumbled down and rolled on the ground with laughter at anything which made him think and tickled him. Looking round upon the trees he would exclaim, "'By George, I can enjoy myself well enough here chopping. I want no better sport.' Sometimes, when at leisure, he amused himself all day in the woods with a pocket pistol, firing salutes to himself at regular intervals as he walked. In the winter he had a fire by which at noon he warmed his coffee in a kettle, and as he sat on a log to eat his dinner the chickadees would sometimes come round and alight on his arm and peck at the potato in his fingers, and he said that he liked to have the little fellers about him. In him the animal man chiefly was developed. In physical endurance and contentment he was cousin to the pine and the rock. I asked him once if he was not sometimes tired at night, after working all day. And he answered with a sincere and serious look, Gore a pit! I never was tired in my life. But the intellectual and what is called spiritual man in him were slumbering, as in an infant. He had been instructed only in that innocent and ineffectual way in which the Catholic priests teach the aborigines, by which the pupil is never educated to the degree of consciousness, but only to the degree of trust and reverence, and a child is not made a man, but kept a child. When nature made him, she gave him a strong body, and contentment for his portion, and propped him on every side with reverence and reliance, that he might live out his threescore years and ten a child. He was so genuine and unsophisticated that no introduction would serve to introduce him, more than if you introduced a woodchuck to your neighbor. He had got to find him out 
as you did. He would not play any part. Men paid him wages for work, and so helped to feed and clothe him, but he never exchanged opinions with them. He was so simply and naturally humble, if he can be called humble who never aspires, that humility was no distinct quality in him, nor could he conceive of it. Wiser men were demigods to him. If you told him that such a one was coming, he did as if he thought that anything so grand would expect nothing of himself but take all the responsibility on itself and let him be forgotten still. He never heard the sound of praise. He particularly reverenced the writer and the preacher. Their performances were miracles. When I told him that I wrote considerably, he thought for a long time that it was merely the handwriting which I meant, for he could write a remarkably good hand himself. I sometimes found the name of his native parish handsomely written in the snow by the highway, with the proper French accent, and knew that he had passed. I asked him if he ever wished to write his thoughts. He said that he had read and written letters for those who could not, but he never tried to write thoughts. No, he could not. He could not tell what to put first. It would kill him, and then there was spelling to be attended to at the same time. I heard that a distinguished wise man and reformer asked him if he did not want the world to be changed, but he answered with a chuckle of surprise in his Canadian accent, not knowing that the question had ever been entertained before. Mm, no, I like it well enough. It would have suggested many things to a philosopher to have dealings with him. To a stranger he appeared to know nothing of things in general, yet I sometimes saw in him a man whom I had not seen before, and I did not know whether he was as wise as Shakespeare or as simply ignorant as a child whether to suspect him of a fine poetic consciousness, or of stupidity. A townsman told me that when he met him sauntering through the village in his small, close-fitting cap and whistling to himself, he reminded him of a prince in disguise. His only books were an almanac and an arithmetic, in which last he was considerably expert. The former was a sort of cyclopedia to him, which he supposed to contain an abstract of human knowledge, as indeed it does to a considerable extent. I loved to sound him on the various reforms of the day, and he never failed to look at them in the most simple and practical light. He had never heard of such things before. Could he do without factories, I asked? He had worn the Home-made Vermont Grey, he said, and that was good. Could he dispense with tea and coffee? Does this country afford any beverage beside water? He had soaked hemlock leaves in water and drank it, and thought that was better than water in warm weather. When I asked him if he could do without money, he showed the convenience of money in such a way as to suggest and coincide with the most philosophical accounts of the origin of this institution, and the very derivation of the word pecunia. If an ox were his property, and he wished to get needles and thread at the store, he thought it would be inconvenient and impossible soon to go on mortgaging some portion of the creature each time to that amount. He could defend many institutions better than any philosopher, because in describing them as they concerned him he gave the true reason for their prevalence, and speculation had not suggested to him any other. At another time, hearing Plato's definition of a man, a biped without feathers, and that one exhibited a cock plucked and called it Plato's man, he thought it an important difference that the knees bent the wrong way he would sometimes exclaim, "'How I love to talk! By George, I could talk all day!' I asked him once, when I had not seen him for many months, if he had got a new idea this summer. "'Good Lord!' said he. 
A man that has to work as I do, if he does not forget the ideas he has had, he will do well. May be the man you hoe with is inclined to race. Then, by gorry, your mind must be there. You think of weeds. He would sometimes ask me first on such occasions if I had made any improvement. One winter day I asked him if he was always satisfied with himself, wishing to suggest a substitute within him for the priest without, and some higher motive for living. Satisfied, said he. Some men are satisfied with one thing and some with another. One man, perhaps, if he has got enough, will be satisfied to sit all day with his back to the fire and his belly to the table. By George! Yet I never, by any manoeuvring, could get him to take the spiritual view of things. The highest that he appeared to conceive of was a simple expediency, such as you might expect an animal to appreciate. And this, practically, is true of most men. If I suggested any improvement in his mode of life, he merely answered, without expressing any regret, that it was too late. Yet he thoroughly believed in honesty and the like virtues. There was a certain positive originality, however slight, to be detected in him, and I occasionally observed that he was thinking for himself and expressing his own opinion a phenomenon so rare that I would any day walk ten miles to observe it, and it amounted to the re-origination of many of the institutions of society. Though he hesitated, and perhaps failed to express himself distinctly, he always had a presentable thought behind. Yet his thinking was so primitive, and immersed in his animal life, that though more promising than a merely learned man's, it rarely ripened to anything which can be reported. He suggested that there might be men of genius in the lowest grades of life, however permanently humble and illiterate, who take their own view always, or do not pretend to see at all, who are as bottomless even as Walden Pond was thought to be, though they may be dark and muddy. Many a traveller came out of his way to see me, and the inside of my house, and as an excuse for calling asked for a glass of water. I told them that I drank at the pond, and pointed thither, offering to lend them a dipper. Far off as I lived, I was not exempted from the annual visitation which occurs, methinks, about the first of April, when everybody is on the move and I had my share of good luck, though there were some curious specimens among my visitors. Half-witted men from the alms-house and elsewhere came to see me, but I endeavoured to make them exercise all the wit they had, and make their confessions to me, in such case making wit the theme of our conversation, and so was compensated. Indeed, I found some of them to be wiser than the so-called overseers of the poor and select men of the town, and thought it was time that the tables were turned. With respect to wit, I learned that there was not much difference between the half and the whole. One day in particular, an inoffensive simple-minded pauper, whom with others I had often seen used as fencing stuff, standing or sitting on a bushel in the fields to keep cattle and himself from straying, visited me and expressed a wish to live as I did. He told me, with the utmost simplicity and truth, quite superior, or rather inferior, to anything that is called humility, that he was deficient in intellect. These were his words. The Lord had made him so, yet he supposed the Lord cared as much for him as for another. I have always been so, said he, from my childhood. I never had much mind. I was not like other children. I am weak in the head. It was the Lord's will, I suppose. And there he was to prove the truth of his words. He was a metaphysical puzzle to me. I have rarely met a fellow man on such promising ground. It was so simple and sincere, and so true, 
all that he said, and true enough in proportion as he appeared to humble himself, was he exalted. I did not know at first, but it was the result of a wise policy. It seemed that from such a basis of truth and frankness as the poor weak-headed pauper had laid, our intercourse might go forward to something better than the intercourse of sages. I had some guests from those not reckoned commonly among the town's poor, but who should be, who are among the world's poor. At any rate, guests who appeal not to your hospitality, but to your hospitality, who earnestly wish to be helped, and preface their appeal with the information that they are resolved, for one thing, never to help themselves. I require of a visitor that he be not actually starving, though he may have the very best appetite in the world, however he got it. Objects of charity are not guests. Men who did not know when their visit had terminated, though I went about my business again, answering them from greater and greater remoteness, men of almost every degree of wit called on me in the migrating season, some who had more wits than they knew what to do with, runaway slaves with plantation manners, who listened from time to time like the fox in the fable, as if they heard the hounds obeying on their track, and looked at me beseechingly as much as to say, O oh, Christian, will you send me back? One real runaway slave, among the rest, whom I helped to forward toward the North Star, men of one idea, like a hen with one chicken, and that a duckling, men of a thousand ideas, and unkempt heads, like those hens which are made to take charge of a hundred chickens, all in pursuit of one bug, a score of them lost in every morning's dew, and become frizzled and mangy in consequence. Men of ideas instead of legs, a sort of intellectual centipede that made you crawl all over. One man proposed a book in which visitors should write their names, as at the White Mountains, but, alas, I have too good a memory to make that necessary. I could not but notice some of the peculiarities of my visitors. Girls and boys and young women generally seemed glad to be in the woods. They looked in the pond and at the flowers and improved their time.